Great. Okay. Um, so uh, I did post um, uh, the previous video here, and um, we're going to be moving on to a few additional features with this before we jump into um, a, a different substrate, as it were, um, for our um, uh, for our focus. So specifically, I'd like to um, take one final component of this and take a look at keeping track of information that is conceptually what might be called in in um, system dynamics world flow quantities. There's there's a lot of epidemiological quantities of interest that are about stocks. Um, and in fact, we've, we've sort of plotted out some of them in Maine. So if you go to Maine and you scroll up, you'll see, you know, for example, there are current smoker counts of current smokers or current counts of um, uh, you know, prevalent case. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, case counts for, um, for heart disease. But what we don't have is, is familiar quantities like incidence of heart disease or incidence of smoking. Right? people becoming smokers. And if you think about it, when we computed these, the number of current smokers, the count of current smokers, or the, the count of people who have heart disease, what, what did we use to compute those? Anyone, anyone remember? What did we use to sort of determine those values? Yeah, we, so we used data sets, and those data sets relied on statistics. In fact, we had these data sets, and and they in turn called this thing here, for example, count, count heart disease. Um, and that was based on population statistics. So if we went to population, we could see in the statistics area, count heart smokers, count heart disease, um, count individuals with heart disease, right? Those were count. So those are cross-sectional counts. And any logic statistics handle very well cross-sectional counts. What they don't allow you to do is to compute directly. They don't provide direct support for recording counts that are accumulated over time as are, as are ubiquitous, right, within, within the health area, particularly when it comes to things like incident case counts, the number per week that have developed, you know, that have started smoking, right? So let's go, let's go remedy that, if we may. Okay, so um, I'm going to do exactly this. Okay, so I'm going to save version 14 in the model. And um, there we go. And we're going to go and keep a running tally of the incident case count. Mark my words, I trust those words carefully. Um, we're going to have a running total. When we have a running total, we'll total up the number who are getting infected each time there's someone getting or developing who's starting smoking. We'll total it up and then we'll finish it. And, and each week we'll start a new one of these, right? Each week we'll report this. There were five this last week. And we will start with a clean slate. And we'll start again, one, two, three, the next week. And then we'll report that, clean it again, and start again. That's the idea. And um, it's a very, very common need. And it's, it's quite readily accomplished. We sought any logic to build this in to, to make available for health modelers you know, uh, back in 2013, 2014, 2015, when we were recommending, recommending priorities for them to incorporate. And unfortunately, they did not do this, so we still do it manually. And I'll show you how, and it's not too bad. Okay, so every month we report some statistics right now. Do you remember this? We had a monthly reporting event here. So every month we'd print out 
the countercurrent smoking. We'll make use of that again to report the incident case count for smoking. So the number of new smokers that came about this, this month. Um, and we'll also report the number of new heart disease cases that came about this month. Is that okay? Number of new occurrences of heart disease. Okay, so I told you we'll tally it up. Marking down one, each, each one, you know, totaling them up, and then we'll clean it. So what do we do when, when we need something that needs to get modified over time successfully, take on new values? What do we use in any way? We use a what? A variable, yeah. So we'll have two variables. Now, do these variables live? Before, we had variables at a person level. Remember that? Color and heart disease hazard. Are these new variables at a person level or at main level? They're main because we're totaling up people getting heart disease across the whole population. So they're at main. So we're going to go down main. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go create two variables from the agent palette. Variable one is going to be called um, cumulative, cumulative um, heart disease um, cases, uh, um, heart disease incident cases for a week. Okay, you, you might want to call it something smaller, but the point is it's heart disease incident cases for this week, and it's, it's counting them up, it's cumulative, All right? Are we okay with that? Okay, and I'm going to make it an integer because it's a count, it's an integer, Are we okay? The count. So it's gonna start at zero. Each beginning of each week, it's gonna start at zero, right? We're gonna wipe away the tally from the previous week and start counting again. Are we okay? Okay, great. So, so we just declared it, mm -mm, sounds good. But where are we going to need to, to tally it up? Like at what point would we need to say, oh, there's a new one, it's one higher. When are we gonna need to sort of mark down, we've got one. Where, where's that going? Yeah, for, in, in this case, it's heart disease incident, but the same idea. And where does that live? Where, where are people developing heart disease in the model? Where does that live in the model? At the agent level and the person agent. See this? In the person level, they're developing heart disease, right? So it's really there. And now we could put it here. And in general, putting it in the state is a little bit clearer because there might be many transitions into the state. If you just put it in the transition, we might forget if we added another one. And kind of logically, it's when you enter the state. So I'll, yeah, I mean, you can argue, but I'll, I'm going to put it in the state. And that would allow us later maybe to add in other transitions without worrying about it. So I want to increment that variable, right? Where does that variable live, this cumulative? count of you know, cumulative heart disease incident cases per week. Where does that live? And lives on main. So what do we need to put here? Main dot, excellent. And then what? Cumulative, yeah, exactly. Cumulative heart disease incident case count per week, right? Sorry? Yes. And then, then should we do something succinct? What, what do we put after it? equals or plus plus, yes, yes, you learn well, plus plus. Sure, we could do that. Or we could say plus equals one, meaning add one to it. Whatever its value was, add one to it. You're no longer scared by plus plus. Plus plus is your friend. Mm. Mm -mm. Okay, great, great. We're cooking with gas. Okay, so we increased it. And now we have to report it, right? Can we report it? We're going to report it in this monthly event. So we're going to print it out, right? 
spray cell and, you know, incident cases, cases. Oh, I said for a week. No, it's not week. It's for a month. Cases of heart disease for month equal or colon, and we'll put, what do we want? What do we want to put there? This dot cumulative, the value that's in that. That's right. Okay, now, but the problem is I misnamed it. Do you see that? So I'm gonna use this chance to teach you another lesson. I'm gonna teach you this lesson. Um, I get a, I, I'm gonna give you some learning, some good learning here, okay? Um, so I'm gonna take this incident, cumulative incident case counts for a week, and I'm gonna call it month, but watch this. I click on its name, I'm gonna change it. But I don't wanna only change it here. I want it to change everywhere that it refers to it. One and done, okay? Can we see it? Okay, so I clicked on this. Now, be careful with this. And Wade is gonna have to translate this into Mackey's. So, so I said for a week, I'm gonna put down and said month, but I'm not pressing enter yet. And I'm going to impress on a, PC, like you folks are using in the room, control enter. And it says it's searching for it and it's going to find it. What is that on Mac? Command enter. So it asks, hey, do you want me to change this one? Yes. And there it goes. Okay. So let's let's go see. Did it did it change it? Yes, it changed it here. It changed it here. And where's the other place it should have changed it? Yeah, it's the heart disease state chart. There, there it is, and it changed it there. It's happy. It's happy. It's our friend. So control enter when you rename something. While you're renaming, after you type the new name, control enter, not just enter, control enter or command enter, and it will replace it. And you can choose, is this a place you want to replace it? Is that a place? Um, in order to just be more careful. Okay, so I built it, and can I run it now? Is that okay? Okay, let's go run it. Mm -mm. Okay, um, I'm going to do the baseline, and I'm running it. Here we go. Okay. Okay, and I'm I'm seeing it run, and down here, I still have these lots of things saying my baseline, my radius is ten. But so far it's zero because it hasn't yet crossed a month. I think after that, it's it's still very very early. So I'm going to speed it up. Here we go. Speed it up. There we go. And there it's printing things out. Um, so far zero zero. Ah oh, one. Now it's one two. You notice something is problem. What's going on? What did we forget to do? We didn't reset. We printed it out. But remember, I said we're going to report it, and then we're going to scrub it clean. We didn't do the scrub clean, yet, right? This will be the cumulative number that have ever occurred, and that's going to be reported, which is sometimes events, you know, the cumulative number of deaths in the COVID-19 pandemic for this jurisdiction, sometimes of interest, but we need to reset it. Are you ready for that? Let's go to Maine, and let's go reset it. Here we go. So we need to reset it. So how would we reset it? Can anyone say? By the way, this is something, this is an event. It's gonna print things out and reset this. And what, what, what are we gonna reset? How are we gonna reset it? Reset it to what? To zero. This dot, because it's a cumulative number for month, we set it to zero. This, this thing goes off monthly and it's gonna be set to zero. We ready for this? So we, we reset it after we report. Print it out, done. Ready? Let's go. Here we go. Boom. I'm gonna run it. I'm gonna speed it up. And hey, and here we go. 
And let's see, where 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 are we time wise? Oh my god. Okay, I have to run it. Boom. Okay. Um there we go. There we go. And you can see some 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 months it's zero, some months it's one, uh, et cetera. And I could slow it down if I want to. Um, one, zero, one, zero, one, one. Okay, so it's printing up the cumulative time. You see the pattern? Okay. Um, I could go do I could go do it for the next one for for the case of counts of smoking. We'd need to distinguish, are we gonna count people who relapse as well as people who start smoking, you know, new cases of that, or do we wanna just record the number of people who are initiating smoking? If so, we'd increment that in this transition right here. If we only wanted to report out the number who are initiating smoking, we'd increment it either this transition or this one, right? Um, or if we want to keep track of the number that are relapsing, we do it here. I could do that. I, it matches the exact same pattern. It's the exact same thing. We just create a variable for whatever we want to report. We increment, we set it to zero there, initialize it to zero. And then where we want to tally it up, we, we add one to that. And then we report out on it monthly and we set it to zero. That's it. Does anyone need me to do those? Like, or is anyone really interested in having me do those? Because if not, I could do another thing, which um, will be quite different. And I want to, I want to do with this model as well. Anyone need me to do these things? Okay. No one strongly needs me to do that. Okay. Um, great. Oh. Um, uh, fatal. Uh, oh. Why was the number? Oh, the number was set to zero because every month we want to report the number for that specific month. So we're, we're this, this is a cumulative cases per month. The idea is we're reporting here the number of new cases of heart disease that occurred for that month. It's an incident case count. It's not a prevalence we're reporting. We could do that with the statistics. This is the number of new cases of heart disease that occurred in that month. And, and then we wipe it clean. You know, we, we tally them up with each one that occurs, we report it, and then we wipe it clean so we could start, so we could say this month there were 50 new cases, that month there were 20, this month there were 70. Are we okay with that? Yeah, yeah, monthly cumulative. Yeah. Monthly cumulative. That's four months. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Michael. Um, okay, so a dynamic event is a, so, so I'll, I'm going to distinguish between the two types of things nominally called events here, okay? Um, one of them is an event, one is a dynamic event. A plain old event um, specifies a sort of event schedule, as it were, that that it's going to go off one or more times over time. You could set it to be weekly or monthly. You could set it to be going off at a certain rate, or you can set it um, to be going off exactly periodically, every week on the button, on the note. But um, that, that's a regular event. It's kind of an event schedule, which could just be one event. Um, you can even set it to go off, I think, under a certain condition. In any case, it's an event schedule. A dynamic event is different. And you will find videos of me covering it. And they're kind of nifty. So a dynamic event allows you to, to create dynamically, meaning like on the fly, um, an event. Um, uh, and we can do this as frequently as you want. You create one, you basically say, hey, create an event to fire off a certain amount of time from now. And I'm gonna provide it all the information it needs right now to do its job, okay? So I provide it, like in creating it, I provided some information. And I'll give you an, an example of this. And then when it goes off, 
it can do something with that information. So here's a classy example. Um, you have a model of cervid, a, a model of chronic wasting disease in deer, mule deer, and when they get created, um, oh, sorry, when, when a mule deer um, is in rut and uh, there's mating that goes on and there's a, a new deer conceived, that deer will be born in six months or something like that. Um, and, or maybe at four to six months or whatever it is. Um, so at the time of conception, you may wish to record some information. Uh, Jermaine, maybe it's whether the parents had, you know, at that time they had um, uh, chronic wasting disease. Um, maybe you want to keep track for some reason of where the conception occurred or, or keep track of who the mother was or whatever. Um, that information you could provide. And you say there's a dynamic event to go off six months hence. So six months into the future, there's an event to go on. And, and that event has all the information it needs to do its job. So when it goes off, boom, it will, it will perform the birth. And, and it, it provides this nice way of kind of um, setting something to go off some time for now, uh, from now um, with the information it needs to, to do its job then. And, you can create it many times. Um, in other words, I can create them at a time of my choosing and, and have them going off, um, which is, is, is often quite nifty. It gives a lot of flexibility. Hope that's helpful. Yeah? Yeah, you, you, you could do that. And I mean, you could set a normal event to go off at that time, but um, like maybe you're reading in from a file a set of historic events. And for each of them, you want to set something to go off at the time of that event. So you're reading it in from a database file on this or something. And it says that the nature of the event and the time, maybe the size of it or whatever it is. And you, you, you will say, aha, okay, you know, two years from now, there's going to be this event of this size and that, and that with that name and, and so on. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get something that will be ready to go off when that happens. And I do it for another event. I do it for another event. I do it for another event. In short, I can create as many or as few as I want kind of on the fly, right? Whereas, like, Otherwise, you have to hard code, if there have events in your model for each of those times, it's like you're hard coding for that data in kind of this ham-fisted sort of way. You're building it into the structure of the model that this goes off at that time, that goes off. And, and it, it's kind of ugly because you really want the flexibility to have different sets of events. Maybe you'd be able to run, want to be able to run it for different jurisdictions or for different kinds of events. You don't want to, you don't want to build that into your model, if, if that makes sense. Um, Wade, you might also want to comment on dynamic events because I know you use them. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Why don't you talk in the mic to Mike? Um, yeah, great. Yeah, so like one of the models I'm working on is uh, involves complex medication regimes. So, for example, they might. They might administer a med and then wait five days and then do it again and then do that so many times over the course of treatment. So you could set up dynamic events that, and you can say, when at the time of the first treatment, we're going to set up these future events that are going to give the second, third, and fourth treatments exactly five days after it receives the first one, regardless of what time that is. So that's that's one example of where I've used a dynamic event. Maya, you had a question before the break that I think um, I 
had suggested you might want to ask once we reconvene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I, I, I certainly wouldn't say not, not strictly true for every, every model. There's plenty of models which I work with where we don't, uh, we don't have that. And um, for example, um, I think for the COVID-19 models that we talked about, I, I don't even think because the focus of that was on a short, you know, it was it was it was anticipated to be for one or two years or something. We 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 didn't have you know a focus on bursts and stuff like that. Um, maybe now it's probably you now it's been added um, to capture it uh, by Kurt. But there are certainly many models we work with where the processes of demographics are important, and then you will you know, generally have some sort of representation of. Of, of demographic event, you know, demographic um, dynamics. Um, but there are some where that's not central. And, and again, the time frames are such, or the scope of the model is such, the purpose of the model is such, you actually don't get into that. Um, um, if you look at the models that have examined uh, in, in this boot camp, there's a fair number of them where that's that's really not not central. We're, not central to the to the purpose of the model, um, so I wouldn't say it's everyone. Now, when you do have demographic events, which are demographic phenomena, which are fairly common, um, so that very important big subset where you do have that. Just bear in mind that um, it's not always a cookie cutter factor. So, I mean, first of all, um, you might have immigration, and some of them you might be concerned with emigration, people leaving. You know, um, leaving the province. Some you don't don't deal with immigration. In other cases, you might deal with um, you know multiple types of chronic disease. Some of which are are lethal and some not. Um, um, you know, some might be really focused on um, on women and, and and family issues and and where you really go into detail on fertility rates by by age. Um, and maybe household structure, some, some models Wade has worked with, including uh, pertussis models, um, maybe chickenpox models, I'm not sure. Certainly um, uh, there's, uh, there's a need for it in some models. You have household structure and you have births occurring to make sure the household size distribution is observed. And, um, and so what I'd say is it's not a cookie cutter thing. I, I would say that birth, appears in a lot of models. Um, but I'd say, you know, how it appears, whether it's, whether there's women distinguished from men or, you know, women of childbearing age distinguished, um, if you represent stillbirths and, and you know, miscarriages as well as, as pregnancies completed to term, um, the degree to which you, you uh, capture, you know, changes uh, in fertility over the, the reproductive uh, cycle, you know, th these are quite, um, quite differ quite a lot by model. So I don't think it's something where we could just um, say, you know, we, it's a cookie cutter thing we use in every model in this way. It, it varies quite a lot. But I will say that a lot of models do have some sort of representation. And that is the, like what I showed you is like the most shockingly crude rendition. I mean, like, like it doesn't even distinguish pre-reproductive years to post-reproductive years. There's no distinguishing, you know, um, reproductive years, and certainly there's none for, for for women shown, et cetera. So it's, you know, that that would be a, it's just to give the flavor of, of you do it, but it could always be elaborated very readily to capture those features. So I I don't know if that's uh, that's helpful, but uh, it appears a lot, but not in exactly the same way. It's different variants of it. That are quite common. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
um, to, to represent first death? Yeah, I mean, uh, so the short answer is yes, if you're trying to predict heart disease, um, to, to have a, a sort of uh, robust, and, and, and I mean, in terms of being able to match the data as well as sort of representing the, the important drivers um, for heart disease, you'd, you're dealing there with a population at real risk you know, of, of mortality and um, where demographic change is a, is a really sizable, um, um, sizable driver for some of the phenomena, you know, the aging of the baby boomers into, you know, higher risk, highest risk age groups for heart disease, et cetera. And, um, and death, you know, deaths of people with heart disease are particularly common because often people with heart disease are at risk, not only of severe cardiovascular outcomes, um, uh, you know, myocardial infarct and, and, and you know, other, other outcomes there, but, but stroke, um, uh, deaths from from, from um, uh, organ damage from other drivers for heart disease like diabetes, um, you know, also leads to chronic kidney disease and some may be passing away through that. So, so the, you know, and you may get coronary heart failure. Some of those have heart disease because they were smokers and they may have COPD and, and be dealing with COPD issues. What I'm saying is it's a very vulnerable population for mortality. And, and I think you, you would need to have some sort of all-cause mortality um, or, or non-heart disease mortality for non-heart disease patients as well as mortality for heart disease patients to account for observed patterns in, in heart disease. I think you're going to have, that's, that's gonna be very, very important for matching um, patterns you see in the population. If you, if you don't have that, the model's gonna think there's gonna be a ton more heart disease patients, but there's not because Tragically, they passed away. Um, so I, I do think you'd need a kind of accounting for that that takes that into account. Now, I know that may sound like a burden, but I would highlight the fact that, you know, having that allows you, um, gives, gives great strength to certain types of analyses you might conduct. And it might, might um, it, it would allow you to much better ask what if questions and see the real consequences for likely deaths from heart disease as well as other conditions. Because remember, if you, if you prevent heart disease or if you, um, you allow for you know, uh, tertiary intervention strategies or, 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 or treatment strategies or, or whatever, or, or prevention strategies, those individuals will probably benefit from it, but they are, it's a competing risk situation where they are, um, they, they are at risk potentially for comorbid conditions for other things. So what I'm saying is that it will give you, it's important to give you a sense of how many life years you would save or quality adjusted life years by investing in certain types of, of um, life-saving treatments because um, you may have saved part of them on, on heart disease, but you may not be able to save them from their COPD or their, their kidney problems and stuff like that. So. In short, yes, I, I think it would be, if, if you want to account for those patterns quite closely and, and anticipate how patterns of heart disease will drive, models like this are exactly what you want. You want the drivers, right? not merely a statistical match, you want the drivers for it in health states, but you do need to take into account that you know, people with heart disease die from things and people with heart disease do die at higher rates and so on. You really would want that. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would look at birth rates or, you know, you, you might you look at birth rates. Um, uh, you could also look at, at uh, fertility rates, which would be, you know, female specific. Um, um, like, Either of those would be, I think, fairly viable here. I, I suspect if you're looking at heart disease, there are some quite notable differences between male and female um, rates of heart disease. So you probably have females in there in the model and you would probably get quite a lot of extra leverage by looking at fertility rates in women by age, um, since women are distinguished anyway, and you look in the 
you know, you, you do it by age to capture the effects of demographic change on fertility of the whole population, on natality, the, you know, the number of births um, in the population. And this is kind of bread and butter stuff that's quite readily done with these models. But yes, it, that information is readily available for, for provinces. StatsCan is chock a block full of, you know, um, uh, analyses of, of population, um, you know, uh, of uh, vital statistics on, on that and such. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Familiar territory for us, we've done a lot of modeling uh, like that now. And, and you can get very good and it's very useful for, for long, long range capacity planning, um, you know, um, for dealing with uh, uh, care needs for, for those with heart disease. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, Time runs on, um, and uh, we've covered a lot here. Um, there is one thing I haven't covered, which I really wanted to cover, and um, I attempted to cover it. Um, uh, we've, we've got a lot of great stuff here. Um, oh, two things. Okay, well, I can easily cover the, I can easily cover one of them. I am going to, yes, I am going to print out, um, uh, so I'm gonna basically output a, a, a data to a file, okay? I'm gonna export data to a file. I told you how to do it manually before, and I'm gonna do it automatically, okay? So when this model, I'm gonna have this, this here model run to a certain time. And when it finishes, I'm gonna have it output data to a file. Are we okay with that? And that file will be a, of a sort that could then be read by R, by Excel, by Stata or SAS or your package of choice externally. Are we okay with that? With your leave then, I will then I will then undertake this. Okay. I am going to um, stop the recording and, and start again because we will we will um, want this in a separate.